Hey everybody, welcome to a, a very special, it's like the after school special episode of Heroes, where we're going to just cover what is kind of what, the world that we're living in right now, which is the golden age of superhero films and TV shows. And with me well, is our special guest today. We've got Vito over here, Vito Lacapola. Uh, <laughs> Lacapola? Close. I got it, Lacapola. Lapicola. Lap Lapicola. It's a very hard name to to, to get, so Sorry. it's fine. I, I always I always call him Vito. That's yeah. why I just don't he say his last name. Vito from Comics on Comics, which is you know. There and, you go. and let me slaughter his last name. Umberto Gonzalez totally got it right. You did nailed it. What's well, poppin' movie talk? Let's get this <laughs> yeah. show on the road. So we are gonna basically cover uh, 2014, 2015, and 2016. And a few years up in the you know, forward, but let's go back into the past before we enter this magical realm that we live in right now. I don't want to go back into the 40s or 50s or 60s or even the 70s. Really old yeah, we're not going to cover that kind of stuff. Oh. But let's let's talk about like you know we got into the millennium, we got in here, we got X Men showed up, uh, Blade showed up. We had films like that that just kind of like whoa, I never thought they'd make a Blade movie. That's kind of weird that Blade is the very first of these superhero films that actually was good. Well, let's right. talk about Blade for a second. Yeah. Well, I, I remember uh, going to see Blade with zero expectations. Mm -hmm. And I remember that first scene when uh, when Blade saves that guy from the meatpacking mm. uh, thing. I was just like, holy shit, I can cuss, right? Yes. OK, good. <laughs> holy <laughs> shit, Wesley Snipes is going to kick ass as his character. And uh, I was really happy that they had taken that character. I read him as a kid. Right. And uh, I didn't think it was possible to make a movie that good about that character, and they pulled it off. So. I thought it was pretty. I mean, what is it? it was Alex Proyas, right? Alex Who did that movie? Norrington. No, no, no. Steve Alex, no, yeah. Stephen Norrington yes. did that, right? He's a pretty good talent, man. And I mean, he really like knocked that out of the park. So, uh, a lot of people don't give Blade enough credit for mm -hmm. being the movie that kind of relaunched the superhero genre. You know, after Batman and Robin yeah. kind of tanked it. Yeah, I think. So, I mean, Blade was the one that came back and was like, "Hey, there is a market for this." What do you think? Oh, uh, Blade was so fresh, especially the opening scene there in the night of da 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 da, and he's like, and then he like takes out the bad guys. He smiles. He does these cool ninja ninja moves and stuff. The like urban audience is like, "Oh, that is yeah. so hot." My favorite part yeah. is like it was a blood shower. They right. were like just like having a rave bloodbath. Right. I mean, it was Absolutely. like, what kind of movie is this? So that popped off. Then we got X-Men. And, and X-Men was one of those films that I think no one outside of the nerds like us were waiting for. They were like, right. oh, well, look, we're trying this. We don't even know what it is. We gave the usual suspects guy the thing. I don't know if it's even going to be successful. And then it was. What do you guys think about X-Men? Well, he, he made a very smart move in getting great actors like Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen to pull those characters off. I think that was one of the first times uh, a director basically said, why don't we get really good actors to star in a superhero movie? Mm -hmm. It's like how Tarantino makes black exploitation and exploitation movies, but he gets A-list actors and that knocks the production right. value up. And uh, I, it's weird to me, if you really look at the first X-Men movie, how they weren't confident in having characters in costumes. Right. And so they gave everybody black leather and they make right. that little joke about the yellow polyester and sure. stuff like that. And now, as you're getting further into the movies, everybody's like, let's actually give Psylocke a Psylocke costume. Sure. You know what I mean? So, let's but it make was, Colossus look like Colossus. Yeah, they actually, yeah, well, we won't talk about Apocalypse because right. he doesn't look like Apocalypse. But for the most part, you know, it was one of the first movies that wasn't ashamed to be a superhero hero movie and I think that really busted open the genre. Historians will look back on X-Men as the first perhaps movie of the, the golden age of superhero movies, mm -hmm. what I call Hollywood's heroic age, that opened the door. These could, these characters could be taken seriously, right. could be enjoyed not only by fanboys, but by general audiences as well, which is what counts, and be highly entertaining. I still think the first X-Men movie, along with the second one, was the best of the series. Mm -hmm. You know, Then when they rebooted with the first class and Days of Future Past, okay, they're doing something good here, but we wouldn't have what we have today if it wasn't for that first X-Men movie. Right. Well, right. actually, I look at Batman, Tim Burton's Batman, as actually the first film that made the rest of the world, not us, take superhero films seriously. Because up until that point, people just thought about Adam West as Batman. Right. Oh, like, God, we already yes. knew about The Dark Knight Returns, but everyone else on the planet, <clears throat> when you mentioned Batman in 1989, before the Batman movie came out, people were like, oh, yeah, Biff Bang Pow, haha, -ha. funny, yeah, it's a joke, right? Am I going to climb up the side of a building now? Right. And then... That's, I mean, that's literally what the rest, of, like 99% of the rest of the planet thought about Batman. They didn't know about Dark Knight Returns. They didn't know about Year One. That's just us nerds, which is a, mi right. it's a microcosm. You got to remember, we're a very tiny majority of a minority. So, that's right. you know, it's like, so 
you know, like when that movie came out, that changed the the overall world perspective on it. It took just from 89 to get to 99, 10 years to get a couple movies a year just yeah. to get going. So then once we started rocking X-Men, all of a sudden Spider-Man shows up. All of a sudden we got a bunch more movies popping off. A lot of them sucked. A lot of them just didn't hit it. Right. Batman, Batman and Robin, the less said about the better. It took several years just to get a new reboot. But that reboot that happened is where we'll start off talking about. Let's talk about 2005. We've got Batman Begins. Oh. So that movie, Batman Begins, that's Christopher Nolan. Already all of us were like, hey, look, this, that's the dude from Memento. That guy's doing Batman. This is going to be crazy. It's going to be off the hook. Vito, what are your thoughts about Batman Begins? The the thing about Batman Begins that always impressed me quite a bit was the fact that, again, with Brian Singer, they took an unconventional director and they said, let's give this guy a shot. Mm -hmm. That Batman Begins is the very first time in movie, in superhero movie history, when they said, let's get a guy who could make a sense and sensibility type film and give him this movie and see what he can do with it. Mm -hmm. It was the first time a director who was serious was taken seriously with a superhero movie. Mm -hmm. People watched X-Men and they thought it was a fluke, but once Nolan kind of arrived on the scene, that blew everything up. Because you look at all of the other films that are coming out now, Kenneth Branagh doing a Thor movie? Who would have ever thought you would have seen Never. that? You know? I mean, this guy made freaking Hamlet and, and, and Much Ado About Nothing, and he's over here doing Thor. You know, so I think uh, Batman Begins was the obvious. I mean, that was when people really started taking it seriously and seeing the potential for the genre, you know? Okay. So, how about you, Umberto? Older nerds might remember that in 04, I did the first script review of the Batman Begins screenplay. It's kind of the story that put me as a reporter on the map. And reading that a year before the movie comes, I was like, wow, this is going to be something special. First of all, being a fan of Bride of the Demon, Son of the Demon, being a big Rasha Go fan. I think they nailed him. I mean, part of making him part of that secret society. So, sure. But the tone is what struck, stuck out to me. They had a comic book guy and David Gorey, who was very hot at the time, do an excellent job along with Nolan. It's also, and it's available still to this day in, in paperback form, a very taut, lean, haiku type screenplay. And then when you finally see the movie, how Christian Bale brings life to this character, how tonally different it is from Tim Burton's version. Totally. I was like, wow. I remember to this day, Hollywood Boulevard, the, the Chinese theater, seeing that with an audience going crazy for it. It's like, and pretty much remembering everything I read from the script, especially Ross Agul. Liam Neeson killed that role. Yeah. You know, and it, it and his character was felt throughout the rest of the series. Yeah. I was like, they got something here. They yeah, got the League of Shadows. I mean, yes, a, the League of Shadows. I, I love that film <clears throat> simply because they didn't use the ordinary villains. They're right. like the five right. villains that are like, you gotta get the penguin or the Riddler or the Joker. It's like, no, right. let's go with the Scarecrow, who's like a little bit lower on the rogues gallery mm -hmm. of the Batman, because Batman's got pretty much the best villains. You got Spider-Man and Batman, they have the best, thought, most thought out right. villains, the most yin-yang villains, the most like, hey, he's a spider, he's a scorpion, he's a this, he's a, so you got like all these different villains that Batman could go up against. He still has never, oh yeah, he did go up against that guy, I was gonna say something, but. Um, with the Scarecrow, I thought it was a really well casting, and I like the way that the Scarecrow was in all three movies. So, yes. You know, they and I liked. I just love the tone that Christopher Nolan brought to Batman, and that was like a tip of the hat to the rest of the film directors mm -hmm. since then, who were like, "Hey, we can actually put our own stamp on it. We can. Ha it doesn't have to be goofy. We can have our own take on it." So I mm -hmm. thought Batman Begins was a great opening to where we are right now. Yes. So moving on, let's go to like let's skip a couple years. Uh, you know, obviously Batman Begins was great. A whole bunch of other superhero movies started dropping between mm -hmm. 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you know, but we're going to just hit the highlight ones. We don't want, we're not going to talk about the ones that even were medium. Like, I don't want to talk about the garbage films or even <laughs> really the medium ones. I just want to talk the cream of the crop. We're scraping that off, drinking yeah. just the cream. And let's go to 2008. I say the cream of 2008, Iron Man. Most definitely. We got Iron Man dropped, and this was like the beginning of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I don't know if they knew how big this was going to be, because in 2007, you would ask someone who is Iron Man and be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. Is that like Iron Chef? You'd be like, no, it's a comic <coughs> book character, Shellhead. No one knew who Iron Man was. You're right. Umberto, Iron Man. I remember summer 2007 being inside Hall H when Marvel was there, mm. and when you could still get into Hall H before it became, yes. a, 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 it became impossible, seeing Feige. Um, Favreau show the first the first images the first footage of Iron Man in flight mm -hmm. when he gets the costume and stuff and we're and seeing the opening scene and the scene where he gets out of the cave I'm like wow 
this is going to be something special. They took a, a second, third tier character and made him a, an all star and a headliner. And I still think to this day the best of the series. I love the first Iron Man movie. It's still one of my top five all time superhero so movies. So well done, so Absolutely. well made. Favreau knocked it out of the park. Oh, Vito. Yeah. Well, you know what's interesting about that movie is they didn't have the rights to Spider Man at that time. Right. And so Kevin Feige basically said, "We're going to take these B and C list characters." Mm -hmm. And we're going to make them stars. We're going to make them A-list characters. Uh, I was visiting Chicago, which is my hometown at the time, and I saw the movie. And I remember I was staying with my uh, my friend Jennifer, and I went to her, and she's an artist. Uh, she's a fine artist. She does sculptures and mm -hmm. things. And I said, you got to come see this movie. And she goes, it's a superhero movie. And she blew it off. I said, I'll pay for it. I'll take you to see this movie. you got to see it. She came out of there running down the street, like right. acting like Iron Man. And that was when I knew something amazing was happening with, with this series, you know? Yeah, I, Iron Man to me was like it was a, a revelation because it's like not only did I, when I, they dropped Iron Man, but at the very end, Sam Jackson shows up as oh, Nick Fury and he's like, "Let's talk about blowing. that Avengers initiative." You're like, "What? what? They're gonna? No one else on the planet knew that what the Avengers was." Yep. But then when the Hulk dropped, which wasn't as great, the Hulk dropped that same year. But they had Iron Man at the very end meeting up with Thunderbolt Ross. Like we've got a situation with this Banner character. Right. You're like they're crossing over. They're they're yes. doing what we grew up reading, where those crossover yep. comics where Spider Man would show up in the Avengers, where the Fantastic Four would show up in X Men. It was like right. these kinds of crossovers we're used to. We're like, no, they're all living the same universe. When, once it got broken up in all these stupid studio rights, you're like, oh, this sucks. Feige and the rest of Marvel were smart when they're like, look, we might have not have all these other characters, but these are the core characters that we just got back, and we can make an Avengers movie if yep. we do this right. right. If we lay the bricks, we lay the pipe right, and we can go right to Avengers, you know, they might have had a bit of a misfire with the Hulk, with uh, casting... Um, Edward Norton. Yeah, Edward, Edward Norton. Norton. But it didn't matter because ultimately, you know, a couple of characters changed out through all these series. Edward Norton, then we got Ruffalo... I love Ruffalo. So let's yeah. let's move That's on. We uh, we covered Iron Man. Let's talk about the Dark Knight. So the Ooh. Dark Knight also dropped in two thousand eight. Now, of course, everyone remembers that unfortunate year that Heath Ledger passed yeah. away. Yep. So everyone knew going in, you're only going to get this one time with this this version of the Joker. And this version of the Joker was the same kind of casting problems that we heard so many people whine and complain about that we heard when Michael Keaton, he, he's not, he can't be Batman, he's Beetlejuice, this is horrible. So many people, you know, look, we're all nerds, we like overreact sometimes, mm -hmm. but you know, I think, I hope that nowadays we've learned to just chill when you hear casting decisions. You might right. not agree with a particular casting decision, but you have to wait till the movie comes out until you actually can have a valid opinion. Otherwise, you just sound like an idiot. So back then, I think a lot of people were like really sounded like idiots. If you look back at like maybe your post, if you complain about Heath Ledger and now you dress up like Heath Ledger, you might be those people, or you might have been like, "Hey, I'm going to wait." And I or if I think it's a great idea. What did you think about Dark Knight? I was the idiot. Uh, I I remember very vocally saying, "This is the guy from Ten Things I Hate About You." Like, why is this? this teen heartthrob gonna right. be in this movie. And then uh, my co-host Juan Manuel and I went to go see Dark Knight on opening night, mm -hmm. and of course, the rest is history. I mean, I came out of there, I was like, I've got egg on my face, guys. Like this, his portrayal was terrifying to yeah. me. Mm -hmm. He's one of those kind of people you would not wanna meet in real life, and mm -hmm. he made him, I think he was the first Joker that was ever, I mean, on, on the live screen, that was ever really terrifying enough to take on the Batman. Yes. Most of the time, you're like, just knock him out. This guy was so crazy and unpredictable that you couldn't, you know, you can't beat chaos. Chaos is always going to win. Bat, I mean, he really loses at the end of that movie. If you think about it, the Joker wins. So, um, yeah, I, I was the idiot. But from that, I never judge it anymore. I can't. I right mean, I can't, I can't look at the actors anymore and think that... It's really hard to tell. You mean, yeah. or you hear about a great actor and they fumble the role. I mean, sometimes right. you just have to wait till the movie comes out. How about you, Umberto? Very personal feelings, because we were the guys back at my previous solid that broke Heath Ledger as mm. the Joker. And it's guys like you right. who are complaining is that the reason me. I swore off common forums, because we were getting, like, killed back in those days. But... Uh, I like the anarchist Joker that Heath Ledger brought to the role. Yeah. We, had a com we had the gangster version, we had the comedian with Cesar Romero, and we never had the anarchist. And now we're gonna get the sadistic version of the Joker along with Jared Leto and Suicide right. Squad. But also 
this is the first time I think uh, they shot in IMAX, a couple of scenes in IMAX, yep. like the, the plate photography and stuff. So seeing that for the first time in Universal City on an IMAX screen, like in widescreen sure. presentation, I'm like, wow, the action was on point. They hit their beats, but the Joker is what made that movie. And gratefully, posthumously, he got the Oscar for it and stuff, but yeah. it, it knocked it out. Deservedly so. Yes. I mean, obviously, I'm a, a giant Batman fan, so you know, he, hearing about his portrayal of the Joker mm -hmm. and my own personal feelings are like, like you know, hey, he's not, he doesn't, he doesn't have the dyed, you know, white, you know, skin. He's obviously putting on makeup after you saw that very first trailer, but it was scary. He looked freakish, so I was like, I cannot wait to see at least what that version of the Chris Nolan take on the Joker is going to be in this more grounded, realistic world that doesn't have magic and stuff. You know, that's that made sense to me. I never thought that Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson, could beat the Michael Keaton. Batman. I mean, when you see them fighting, or you know, at the very end, I'm like, Batman's gonna just punch this guy yeah. out. And he literally did, but then he spits out. Like, what are you doing? You're gonna hit a guy with glasses? Yeah. He was like, that's that version of the Joker. This is the terrifying, nightmare-inducing. This is a guy who'll kill you. Yeah. This guy will torture you to death and send the news clip. And be like, look what I just and for did, no you know? other reason than that he could. Yes, that was so. what made him so scary. So I, I thought this was the best. This is like the Empire Strikes Back of Batman. Yes. For me, it's like. It's like the best oh sequel to any of these standalone superhero films I've ever seen. It's one of my top 10 superhero films Absolutely. ever made. Just the tone and everything. You know, if I wanted to complain about The Dark Knight, I'd say I wish the last 30 minutes didn't happen. The Two-Face tagged on ending. Because yeah. I felt it really could have ended with the Joker swinging upside down and leave Two-Face for the second movie. I didn't need to see all that extra stuff. I already felt like I had a full movie. But that's just like a minor complaint. The movie's pretty fantastic. And it's a great noir as well. It was, it was just named, I believe, by the British Film Association as uh, one of the top 100 best American movies ever made. Wow. I mean, that that shows that it's pretty damn yeah. well made. I have zero complaints about that. I think that's... I, I do not either. Yay, UK. Yes. So Want to know how I got these scars? Right, that's <laughs> right. Lots of different stories. Yes. A lot of people are like, I want to hear see the Red Hood story of how he got right. those scars. But let's, uh, let's move on to uh, 2009. A movie that was a very famous graphic novel back in the 80s was finally adapted by Zack Snyder. We're talking about The Watchmen. Now, I think The Watchmen broke a lot of new ground for a lot of reasons. Number one, because it was an R-rated superhero film. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, it didn't actually break the budget. It didn't make a billion dollars. But what Zack Snyder did was something really special. What he could have done was just like, look, I, I, the comic is the comic. I'm just going to make my own version. But what he did do was he's like, I am going to, and a little different than what uh, Robert Rodriguez did with Sin City, which was like, he worked with Frank Miller. They did a, you know, a storyboard kind of like comic book adaptation of Sin City, which also I loved. But Watchmen really did it so fantastically well that it took all of Dave Gibbons comic book art, which Alan Moore had scripted painfully so in every 12 frame sequence. If you, you know, if you, if you read the uh, comic book, mm -hmm. you'll see like just how meticulous with the script notes that it was. And Dave Gibbons just nailed it. So what Zack Snyder did was took all of that and adapted it as a compositional way of like, look, that's, that's our storyboard. Then we'll add to it. So for just for that alone, look, everyone can complain that the squid's not in it. There's a lot of Things that they're that back and forth. I've seen the ultimate, ultimate cut, which is roughly three and a half hours yes. with the animation put in there. I'm not a big fan of the way that animation was executed, but I, I still like that ultimate cut. If I want to watch the full Watchmen film, that's the version I actually want to see because it's the most complete one. Vito, mm -hmm. what do you think about the Watchmen? I think I think it's a pretty masterful movie, honestly. Um, he, he got the casting down pat. Mm -hmm. I mean, every single person in that movie is exactly the way that you see them in the in the book. I mean, Jackie Earl Haley is, as Rorschach is freaking brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. um, the only misstep I think that they took in this movie was that um, I know he was trying to make that meta commentary on on superhero movies by adding nipples to the Ozymandias suit right, right. As, a, as a nod to like the Greek gods, but as well as Batman and Robin. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, but... I didn't like the fact that the fight scenes were so unrealistic, considering that this was supposed to be what the world would really be like if real people fought crime. You know, those the fight scene in the in the jail is so over the top. You're like, it becomes it's like kick ass. Right. How kick ass the movie, the fight scenes are so over the top that it almost detracts from it. Um, aside from that, though, he did a damn good job of adapting that. I, I read the Sam Ham script, which yeah, ooh, is ooh. is really bad. Mm. May you rest in peace. But the script is terrible. Uh, and you see what Paul Greengrass wanted to do with it by making it a modern movie and making right. it more, you know, like a handheld movie and stuff. I think Zack Schneider showed enough reverence for the, for the original material and there's enough in there for you to love. 
Uh, people I know who had never read comic books before love that movie. So yeah. that's saying something, you know? I mean, it's a flawed masterpiece, but it is a masterpiece. Vita. Absolutely agree 100%. A, a flawed masterpiece for sure. Zack Snyder took a very difficult book, okay, and executed it perfectly. I mean, to me, to stand out to this day, I love the comedian. What he, what, uh, I forgot the name of the actor. Jeffrey Dean, Dean Morgan. Morgan. Jeffrey yeah. Dean Morgan nailed that out the park. So yeah. Spectre. Um, I, I too agree that because I have the ultimate cut also. So like I always when I keep it on when I'm working and stuff. Uh, the narration is I it's it's as close a translation that we'll ever get again mm. because then I remember before the movie came out there was the animated uh, the motion the motion yeah comedy. with a dude doing all of the voices <laughs> yes I was like yeah, can't you just afford to get a female yes. to do the female voices what is wrong with you so people? I haven't the read it in like twenty comic, years yeah. I revisited that I, yeah. I saw the actor uh, reenact all those voices just to get familiar with the material mm -hmm. I love the movie man it's like it works I like dark edgy superhero movie because it, it it kills that stereotype that superhero movies could be in mature or for right. kids and stuff that it could also resonate with general audiences which that movie did and became a cult classic on video on home video and uh blu-ray and everything and digital release so it's it's still one of my top five i would say uh, you know i'd argue your point Vito, because the one thing that you, you brought up was that prison sequence i thought the realistic fight scene was when um uh, Night Owl and Silk Spectre and just in their, you know, human garb, like yes. not costumes, fight those not top oh, guys. Right. And they show that extreme violence. That that to me was like, this is is what you would get if you actually went up against someone who was a superhero, but you didn't know it. Right. You'd get your legs and arms broken. You'd be shattered on the floor. I thought the prison scene was Snyder tipping his hat to those kinds of big actions. That's how I felt. Yeah. I felt it was like, I agree with you, it wasn't realistic, but I felt it was like, it was like, here's a moment where we'll go into the my 300, you know, yeah. so to speak, kind yeah. of action sequence. But you know, I didn't I didn't mind the fight scenes. I loved the watch the the uh Dr. Manhattan sequence on oh, Mars. It was brilliant. That was like yes. right out of the comic. That's one book. of the greatest, if you take that sequence out of that. It's it's one of the best short films ever made. Yeah. Yes, the music, Beautiful. the Philip Glass music, and and the narration. That's something uh, too. Is a lot of people were upset that Billy Crudup did that that very relaxed mm. delivery. But if you think about it, this is an enlightened being. This is a man who was torn apart and put himself back together very meticulously. That's that's a very you know wound up mind. Not to use the the clock analogy. I mean, he was perfect as that character yes and he really pulled off that weird otherworldliness definitely that he needed if it would have just been a dude walking around or somebody trying to sound like a god right it would have been really over the no, top i thought he silly. delivered it perfectly as well you yeah. needed that kind of reserved quiet tone because yeah. basically he can do anything yeah and he's already known that for like yeah, 20 years like, he's that, like, so that sequence where he blows up rorschach at the end he, oh. he just doesn't give a shit you know yeah. i mean he's just like yeah it's just atoms coming apart to us you know we're losing our favorite character in the movie but to him it's just not uh, and you know? honestly, that sequence was so perfectly done that it reminded me of when I read that comic book at that last issue where I was yep. like, no, at the, you know, where he just it explodes. Rorschach. There's no, yes. there's no sympathy there. None. I mean, you know, they, they don't make it maudlin and they don't try to drag it out. He just very casually points and pops but him and that's it. Rorschach knew he was like, do it. I yeah. mean, that's that cool moment where you're like, yeah, Rorschach is such a badass. No all the compromise, way compromise, yeah. even in the face of Armageddon. Totally. Yeah. So great. Yeah. And that Jackie, uh, her, Jackie uh, Earl yeah. So great. So good, man. Oh. Let's move on to 2011. Let's talk about Captain America, the first Yay. Avenger. So this movie really did something fantastic for me. It took us to the forties and, and gave us an action film set in World War II. I, I never expected them to do that because that's a risk that's more expensive. Like, hey, look, you're taking a risk. You're taking a property. You got to go back into the 40s. Are people going to dig that? Are people going to, like, our modern world, do we want to go back and watch a World War II movie? Obviously, we did, and we loved it. Vito, what do you think about Captain America, First Avenger? Uh, the thing that I loved about that movie was that it had the vibe of an Indiana Jones film. Yes. Totally. Which, which blew my mind. And it's cool because Joe Johnson worked on all the Indiana Jones movies and stuff totally. like that. He designed and Boba Fett. Yeah, isn't He's that one amazing? of those. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, the fact that it took us to the, to the 40s, I, I was happy about that because you'd had DC Comics talking about how we can't make a Wonder Woman movie set in the 40s. No one's going to go see this. And this movie proved that you could do that right. if you told the story well and you had an engaging character. And uh, what's really interesting, too, if you notice the title, The First Avenger, they even made it really, it was a smart move because oh, yeah. they were like, this is risky, but we're going to show them that this is the first character that we're going to pop into an Avengers movie, mm -hmm. that we're leading up to something, and it was, I don't know, they're, they're brilliant at marketing, but I, I love movies set in the 40s, so for me, mm -hmm. 
I, the fact that kids wear Captain America shirts now and they didn't 10 years ago is amazing. It's pretty cool. I love seeing yeah, it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's especially cool for us older nerds who grew up reading Captain America and no one knew who Captain America or the right. Falcon was or any of this. Right. And now you see kids with shields and stuff. You're like, hell yeah, this is yep. awesome. I was going to say the first Avenger I think was tacked on just solely because like outside of America – we have some people who are like, I don't want to go see a movie called anything America. Yeah, so they're like, true. let's call it the first Avenger. And that way, you know, some some place it was called Captain America, the first Avenger. Some place it was released as just the first Avenger. Hmm. But, you know, just to let you know, that's one, one of the reasons. Interesting. The marketing, they were like, we're going to we're going to handle this. So it got handled right. Right. Humberto. One of my favorite all time Marvel movies for reasons he just said they Marvel had the testicular fortitude to go forward and make a period piece. Mm -hmm. And they found a way to do it in the past and then bring it towards for, to us in the present when he wakes up in New York City. Um, you got to love that that tag at the end when he sees Nick Fury because you know they lead into the Avengers and it, it was attached to the print, the trailer oh, for yeah. the Avengers, remember? Totally. The trailer for the Avengers was attached to the print. I loved what, um, like it was a surprise when you they went after Chris Evans and he turned it on a couple of times because of his previous association with the Human Torch. Right. But everything from the storytelling, the characterization, the action, uh, the tone, it just like you said, it felt like a, a Raiders movie. Yeah. I'm surprised they haven't asked him to come back and do another one or two for reasons I don't know, but it's it's um, it's a perfect period piece superhero movie along there with Watchmen and stuff. So, And now that opening the door for, like you said, a Wonder Woman movie that we'll get in the past and maybe other superhero movies based in the past, like in the 40s and the 50s and stuff. But I loved it. And like when you see, they discover him in the beginning, then they tie it in in, in the future. Oh, in present day, it was just, it was, yeah. I'm it just also fanboying gave right us, now. I know, me too. And it also gave us Haley Atwell. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. as Agent Carter, who is just the bee's knees. Yeah, she's had quite she's, a career. Oh, she's, she's so she's great. She's managed yeah. to sustain and she's got her own show now. She's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. She's in episodes of Black Mirror. Now I'm like, hey, that's her, that's, you know, it's like yeah. now you're like yeah. seeing her pop really up and all good. these other yeah. things. I love Captain America also because not only was it set in the 40s, but they also did really great interpretations as to why does he wear this outfit? Because it's right. from the USO, like, hey, we're Captain America. Yes. And then it's oh, like, yes. what do we do with this dude? You know, he's like yeah. a superhero. We're done with him. It's like, it's like, it just made so much sense. And it really, this is the movie that really let Chris Evans shine. Because yes. up until this film, he was just like, ah, it's a good looking dude. He's like, you know, whatever, he's a human torch. I didn't really care about his career yeah. or him as an actor. I was like, oh, he's going to play one of my favorite characters as a kid, as Captain America, when Jack Kirby was drawing him mm -hmm. from Tales of Suspense, all those World War II stories where he was fighting the, the Red Skull. That's what I grew up reading. So I really uh, like wanted this to work. What do you think about the priest pre super soldier Steve Rogers? Like the way they did that special effects. Fantastic. They made little guy. That was incredible, awesome, man. That's so, what I was most worried about. How are they going to break that guy who's six feet tall into like 4'11", 5'2", and they nailed it perfectly. And, and most of that I give credit to, not just the special effects people, but to Chris Evans yeah. for being able to act He's as a weak really good. character yes. who believes in this country, believes in the things. He wanted to like help in mm -hmm. any way that he could to the point where he was going to sacrifice his life you know, so I mean, it really, it's one of those superhero films that really hit home for me. So, yeah, love Captain America. Let's talk about another 2011 film. This one is the return of some of our favorite characters, X-Men First Class. Now, X-Men First Class, for a long time before it came out, I was really worried about it. I was like, well... I don't know what it's going to be. I, I saw the outfits and some some of the earlier, you know, I was one of those people. Like, I don't know if I like the yellow outfit. I was one of those people. I was like, <laughs> right. you know, uh, I kept it to myself, though. But, you know, I still had those feelings. I was like, ah, you know, I wasn't 100 percent sure on how this was going to work out. Mm -hmm. I didn't like X-Men Last Stand. I, I, you know, I think X-Men Wolverine Origins had already come out as well. And I didn't mm -hmm. like that. So I was like kind of giving up on the X-Men franchise, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. I was like, ah, it's probably going to, all, all of them are going to suck. And then I saw the movie and my mind was blown away. Matthew Vaughn knocked it out of the park. Yeah, he did. I mean, literally, <clears throat> Professor X and Magneto, the younger versions, <laughs> I could not have thought in a million years that I'd like them better than the older interpretations. Yeah. But I did. And then it made me actually appreciate the older versions better. It, it was had a retrofitting work, where I was like, now nah, I even like you know Patrick Stewart even better because of the way James McAvoy is playing Professor X, the younger version. So right. to me, everything about that film was incredible. I love the origin and the the the, the further telling of Magneto's origin too. Umberto, what did you think of First Class? Oh, I, I'm with you. I, I I prefer the younger versions of Magneto and Professor mm -hmm. Xavier over their older counterparts and stuff. Right. And basically, Fassbender played Magneto with such 
male model swagger. He made him cool. He made him chic. Such a badass yes. when he's hunting yeah. Nazis. You're like, come on, this is insane. Yes. I could watch a whole movie you of that. A whole yeah. movie about that. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was a conversation. He could do his own James Bond spinoff film. Him getting he Nazi. was very Sean Connery in that. Yes. Movie. Oh, he was very, boring. very Sean. But Connery. let's not forget. The cam the Wolverine cameo. <laughs> right. What happened? Go after yourself, you know? And they paid it off in the next film in Days of Future. Totally. That cameo was awesome. Yep. I was like, yes. Yeah. I, I was very undecided on first class as well. I love Matthew Vaughn. I remember seeing uh I, I was a fan of his as a producer with Lockstock sure. and Snatch and those yeah. things. And when he did Layer Cake, oh. I remember seeing Layer Cake in the theater and going, like, that guy, he's a way better director than he is a producer. Mm -hmm. You could tell he was just waiting to get his teeth into things. Mm -hmm. So um the fact that he was able to reinvent the X-Men films and make them interesting again and and get the yellow suits in there, I mean he managed to squeeze those in and nobody cared. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Um, I think Fassbender steals the movie. I yeah. mean, that guy is just, he drips charisma. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it made me excited to to watch the X-Men movies again. I just kind of petered out after Last Stand. You know right. what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I didn't want to see another one and it made me happy. So you can't ask for more than that out of a superhero movie. And he just signed on. I broke this week that he signed on to do more movies. Him Sweet. and for, McAvoy. For the X-Men? McAvoy and Fassbender over Good. the weekend. I got a tip that uh, they're gonna they signed on for more X Men movies. So Was it like two or three more? I would imagine it's three. So we might see them team up with Deadpool in the That's future. That's great. You know, to me, I feel like it's really smart for actors if they're in a popular franchise to sign on for as many as yes. possible. Why? Because it's an uncertain world in the future, i.e., next year, i.e., two years from now as an actor. You never know what's going to go on. So if you're attached to a great franchise that comes out once every three years, mm -hmm. you have a refreshing, a refreshment. To the audience, every time you're Magneto, everyone's like, oh, Magneto. And then you get another couple of awesome roles that you could pick. You can also pick really cool films. Like I just saw Slow West with Matt, uh, with Fassbender. Mm. It's this Western. It's great. It's a really slow film. It's a great Western done on a very small budget. Probably no one even knows what I'm talking about. It's a it's an independent film, but he got to do that. And just by Fassbender's name on it, it helps these independent films get a little bit more love because they're, oh, he's a star. So he's right. able to... It works both ways, I think. So I'm really happy that those guys are going to keep doing it. That was that was the whole uh, the born identity kind of started that thing because Matt Damon was really like, I need a hit, I need a hit. Now, whenever he needs something to like blow up again, he does another born movie and everybody's happy. Totally, so, and he gets yeah. another five years of flavor. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of flavor, let's go on to another 2011 film, Thor. So here we are. We're like talking about like I never in a million years thought I would see Thor or Asgard or Odin. Or the Warriors three or yeah. Sif in a million years. Hemdil, come on! I love the Jack Kirby version of Thor. Yeah, that's one of my all-time favorite cosmic world, and I cannot believe how amazingly well Marvel took this and then was able to take Iron Man and the real world of technology mm -hmm. and spin Asgard into it by explaining magic as th it's just science, but you don't understand it. Mm. It's such a cool way that they were able to take that. And that works for every single film after that. It explains magic in a really cool way. I don't know how they're going to explain Doctor Strange, but they started to at least scrimp in there with Ant-Man a little bit. That's quantum physics. and So you're going to get some trippy, weird shit in Doctor Strange. But at yeah. least with Thor, you were able to explain away the magical elements of Asgard by just saying it's science. What did you think of Thor? I was really surprised by it. Uh, I was never a huge Thor fan in the comics. Um, there was one, uh, Michael Avon Emming mm. uh, did this really great run of Ragnarok that I mm. thought was amazing. But uh, aside from that, he was never my favorite character. But again, Marvel has a way of taking these guys and making them really appealing. Mm. Uh, it was a big thrill for me to see Jack Kirby's designs. I mean... You know, you sit there because uh, my buddy Juan Manuel and I were always talking about how, like, you're never going to see this Kirby stuff on screen. Wouldn't it be great if they got the big circles on the costumes? Right. And when I saw Thor's costume, I was like, they did it, man. And Asgard was, I mean, can you imagine what Jack Kirby, if, if there is a heaven, what he must have been thinking looking down on that? Mm -hmm. And he's like, I fucking made that. That's mine. <laughs> it's all from his brain. That's you know? right. And Berto, what do you think about Thor? I'm, with Vito, I wasn't too crazy about uh, Thor in the comics. And I remember when Matthew Vaughn at what time was attached to direct that movie. Right. And then that yeah. script that that got out and stuff and how majestic and huge the vision was. But we're, we're missing one thing we didn't discuss that Thor did besides, Iron, besides uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man. 
they birthed a megastar in Loki. Mm. Oh, like, yeah. Totally. He, yeah. to me, stole the movie. He got longevity out of it, quite the career. Remember uh, the Comic-Con presentation? You mewling quim. And he oh, had the yeah. audience in his hand. Oh, yes. yeah. They birthed a megastar with that. But uh, also, like, the Easter eggs. Like, you, could see, you could see the Infinity Gauntlet in Odin's vault and yes. stuff. But, uh, yeah, basically, Chris Hensworth stood out for me as a role. And like you said, he, mm. Marvel has a way of making these characters appealing. So Thor, but Loki standing out, Odin, of course. And, and, and it, was, it was serviceable. I liked it and stuff. You know? Yeah, Hiddleston is like, yeah, he's a, he's a star now because yeah. of his turn in Thor. He's yeah, become a star. And he's an incredible actor, too. Yes, I mean, he he's is. like one of these people who came from theater where he can memorize entire plays and just rock them out. A lot of actors can't even memorize a line. What's my line again? They just show up after having breakfast and didn't even read the script. Right. This guy's got everything memorized and your lines and your lines. He's a true actor. And he so also, by the way, I knew I knew when he was going to be a star is the line where he's talking to Odin mm -hmm. and he says, tell me, father, you know, and, and Odin tries to like blow him off and he goes, tell me. The way that he screamed it, mm -hmm. I remember turning to my buddies and I was like, that guy can really act. Mm -hmm. That guy's amazing. Yeah, he brought way more depth to that character than anybody else could have brought to it, I think. Yeah. So Thor yeah. really is a Shakespearean. That's why they had to get Kenneth Branagh. You're right. like, when you think about it, they're like, look, well, how are we going to portray this? Let's get that dude who knows how to rock yeah, this. Yeah, it's already. Shakespearean. Yeah. What do we do? We'll get a Shakespearean director. Yeah. Done. Let's move on to the year 2012 and let's talk about the granddaddy, the big movie, the one that rocked everybody, The Avengers. Now, this is a movie that everybody was waiting for because we just had literally like five, six years of waiting to see it because Iron Man, then you had the Hulk, then you had Captain America, then you had Thor. Now you're going to see all of those characters in a one movie with a couple other characters like Hawkeye and Black Widow. I mean, literally, I cannot tell you how excited I was yeah. that, that The Avengers was a fun film. I couldn't stop smiling. I had a friend at Marvel who, who was like, yo, dude, you want to see the Avengers early? My girlfriend, Holly, was really pissed that I went because I couldn't <laughs> take her. But I was like, look, it's the Avengers. Right. I have to see it. It's two weeks before it came out. I have to see it. It was like maybe it was a month before. I can't even remember. But it was like an early screening. And I was just grinning the entire time. Like it was like I felt like a 12-year-old kid watching that film because they executed everything that I loved as a kid in the Avengers but made it really enjoyable as an adult. So it's like, yep. I got to see the Thor, the, the, the Thor, I got to see Thor fight the Hulk, which is something that they had done in so many times before they just did it so well. Even though it was only like a two minute thing, that was like, I can't even believe I'm seeing this. I mean, every single scene, I was astonished at how I couldn't believe that I'm seeing all these characters that I loved as a kid all interacting and they did a great job with having Loki be the villain mm -hmm. and bringing in this crazy weird threat from outer space by introducing the idea of outer space and Thanos <coughs> and another world and all these kinds of realms that exist. What did you think of it? Note perfect. I, one shot that will always stand out to me is the hero shot, that 360 hero shot when they're all standing together. Ready totally. To Oh my God! It's actually on the screen behind you right now. That's it. There yep. it is. That hero shot will always stand out to me. And they and uh, Captain America, uh, the the Thanos post credit scene tag that everybody was so excited oh, yeah. about. Um, it's Except just, for the people who thought it was Hellboy. What? Uh, there were people who thought it was Hellboy. Come on! I, yeah, I, I, I swear to God, that. in the movie theater, there was a woman behind me who went, "Hellboy gonna be in this jam," and I was like, Sorry. "It's not Hellboy." No, you're talking about uh, not people. You're talking about idiots. That's okay, what you're talking. Yeah. About. Like, so like hey, if somebody, Hellboy gonna be in this jam, who, in our circle said that's like hand in your nerd card right now. Put it Absolutely. down right now. Right. No one, no one in our crew would ever say that. That's right. like a that's like a newbie. Like mm, it's Hellboy. Hey, get out of here! All yeah. right. But who the, the hell do you think you are anyway? The shared concept. I idea that they executed brilliantly. You got an, a hero in each of their own movies as their own stars now working together as a team. That hasn't been, that's never been done in cinema before. No. And we, we're used to it in comics, but now our audiences and general audiences seeing that together for the first time, it was a very special moment. I must have seen at least four or five times in the theater with a crowd, and it was always more exciting each time. Did you guys tear up a little bit? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I kind of had tears in my eyes, too. When I was a kid, um, you had the Incredible Hulk show with Bill Bixby. Mm -hmm. and, and that's did, the thought we had, They did remember? these movies. Yes. They did a movie with Thor. They had Daredevil when he was in his yeah. black costume. I right. think it was Rex Harrison. They were bo and both, um, both of them were horrible. Yes, yes. Were, and, and, oh. and they like had Thor, uh, like Don John Blake Davies. Yeah, yeah. And with and like he, weird visor, and yeah, it's like, he's not to be the kingpin. Yeah, but I remember seeing those as a kid, and you think to yourself, man, if they could just get all of these actors together. Right. But but back then, you know, 
they didn't have a Kevin Feig. Is no. it Feige or Feige? It's I think Feige. it's Feige. Okay, it's Feige. There was no Kevin Feige to say, why don't we have the balls to put all of these characters together and get lesser known stars so we don't have to pay $10 billion for the budget? Right. And I, I never in my life would have ever thought I would have gotten to see an Adv Avengers movie, let alone a Justice League movie. I mean, you know, you hear about the rights being tied up and all these different things and everything. And what they did was they just said, we're going to do it. Hell, you know, hell be damned. Yeah. They wrote the definition of frame. They announced that movie four years prior. In 2008, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, yep. we're going to do this, and we're going to culminate it in this, something you've never seen before. Right. That took major testicular fortitude to do. That's right. When everybody else was, oh, all the haters from around the town, oh, it's not going to work, or this and that. Wait till they get to contract negotiations. They found a way to do it, and they yeah. executed it brilliantly. It's the first time we see a movie make $200 million opening weekend. Yeah. My goodness. That's why we know what phase two is, or phase three. Like right. these weird, like, what are you talking about? Is a phase four? I remember that as a movie with ants. No, this is totally <laughs> different. So let's move on to 2013 and talk about a controversial <laughs> film, one that I think really helped open up the DC cinematic universe. It's called Man of Steel. Now, this is the film that finally put Superman back on the map. Let's forget about some of the other films. This is the film that actually was a giant budgeted film with Superman as the main star fighting other Kryptonians. Let's talk about it. Vito, what do you think? Uh, as Watchmen, I think, is a flawed masterpiece. <clears throat> I, I'm just not a big fan of Man of Steel. I, I love Henry Cavill as Superman. I think he's absolute pitch perfect for the choice. I think Kevin Costner as, as Pa Kent would have been perfect if they had gotten the character right. right. Um, I, I feel that the fundamental flaw of the, of the movies, and, and a lot of people love them and a lot of people hate them, but the Kents are kind of dicks in, in these movies. And because they're dicks, you get a Superman who grows up to kind of be a dick. Like uh, Superman has never been a character that has ever thought twice about being a good person. He shouldn't be conflicted about going out and helping people. And you see him helping people <coughs> in the movie, but he's always kind of like torn about it. What should I be doing? I mean, I wanted to see a more decisive, sunny, upbeat Superman. Mm -hmm. That's just my personal opinion. But I mean, I, I like that Superman. I, I don't like the morose, oh, it's always raining and, you know, I should be in a Tim Burton movie. No offense. Right. <laughs> but, you know, it's like... I want to see the happy Superman again. And I, I don't, you know, people say, well, by the third movie, he's probably going to be the Superman we know and love, but he should have always been the Superman we know and love. That's what we love about Superman. So I think it's a flawed movie. Visually, it's brilliant. I, I don't have anything against Zack Schneider. I think the guy's a great director. Um, I just, uh, you know, it wasn't my Superman. So I, I kind of I hated the next snap. What do you think? Since we're similar in age, I grew yeah. up revering what Dick Donner did yes. with Superman. Great. But when Zack Snyder put Henry Cavill in the cape, I love the movie. I'm one of those that defend the movie staunchly. I love it to, the, to this day. Every time it's on HBO, I keep it on. Uh, I love the Easter eggs in there where sure. you see LexCorp, when you see Zod drop his armor. Oh, that's going to that's gonna probably be something in the future right. film. It worked for me. I, I didn't have the, the problem with the Kents. Um, it brought a it grounded Superman. It's not an easy character to do. No. Nope. Okay, Zack Snyder knocked it out the park. Uh, and I think it's established... I think Batman vs Superman is going to open it wide, but to me, it established the DC cinematic extended universe and stuff. So I can't wait to see what they do next. I, I, it's like in that shot right there, you probably see Superman grow more into his own as he's now got to face an equal, not a physical equal, right. but a heroic equal in Batman and stuff. So it's a good setup film, it, you know, and. It works, and I'll always have a reverence for it. And I mind you, I grew up with and got every special edition of the Dick Donner Superman, sure. but I prefer Henry Cavill Superman over the Dick Donner. So I grew up loving Superman, mm -hmm. the movie. I believed a man could fly as a yeah. little kid, and then Superman 2 just destroyed yes. me, seeing him, like, for the first time, <laughs> like, we actually got, you were talking about, like, uh, the Hulk, yeah. and, like, Thor was, so you never, you didn't really, they didn't really fight each other, you threw him through a wall, that right. was it. This, you got to see, actually, superheroes flying around and fighting each other with laser vision and stuff. As a kid, that's what you want. <laughs> right. Uh, what you don't want is Superman 3. Oh, God, no. A horrible, boring film, <laughs> which didn't work at all. He fights a computer at the end, as right. Atari graphics, horrible film. Embarrassing, and of course, directed by Richard Lester, the guy who stole Superman 2 from Dick Donner. Yes. Uh, I'll never forget that. That's why I always like to remember it and, <laughs> and mention it. Um, so you see a horrible film like Superman 3, and then that film gets beaten in a horrible film by Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. I mean, I dare you to just watch it. I dare you to watch that film. It is so horrible, and it's, it, it's cringeworthy. So yeah. nothing can really top, and that's Christopher Reeve. 
That's like people always put him on a pedestal. He wrote some of that movie. He wrote part of four. Yeah, I didn't know that. Oh, that's his story. Fact, yeah. It's like Don't he's a producer. And a story. Sorry, I have to. Um, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with him in the first yeah. two films, but Superman Four was the death knell of the Superman franchise, just like was. Batman Four was the death knell of Batman. They just didn't get it. The people who were involved didn't understand what they had and destroyed it. Why do you guys think that the first couple of movies are always really brilliant, and then? For some reason, they just start going, ah, let's just skate through three and four. Uh, I, I can answer that. Why Greed that and happen? stupidity. I mean, I think it, it ends up the people who cared about it are pushed away because the right. people who own it are like, want more money and get just do what I, you know, let's try something different and don't really care about it. So, so the people who care film, about right? it. The fourth one. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And Golan Globus and all these other awesome dudes. So, um, so the fourth one, the fourth one destroyed the franchise. So obviously, you know, 17 years passed with them doing tons. I made a, I made a film about the Superman Lives Tim Burton Nick Cage one, that was only one of the tr the attempts at trying to get this character, this franchise, rebooted because it was like a very difficult time to get that character back after that financial bomb. And basically they had like, you know, Superboy and then they had Smallville on. So they were like really trying. Brian Singer's Superman Returns, to me, even though it was like totally riddled with like nods to Richard Donner. And when I saw the trailer and I heard that John Williams music, I really bought into it. I was like, all right, cool. They're going to go back and do that. And then when I saw the movie, I realized that's a bad idea because it's actually boring. Yes. Right. If you go back and mine the past and don't add anything new to it. So basically what that movie was was a retread of everything that I loved as a kid without anything new. So I, I thought Grant, yeah, I mean, Brandon was great as Superman. He did a great job. I think Brian Singer did a great job directing it. It's really well shot. It's just boring and nothing really new happens. So yes. I know that they were like, look, in, in the second one, we're going to do new stuff, but it was already that book, the closed, it was over. So we had to wait a couple more years, six more years. Zack Snyder, hot off of all these other films, pops on, does Man of Steel. I personally love the film. Now, is it a Superman that it, that all the other Superman lovers love? Because of, you know, like you were saying, you like that brighter, lighter Superman. For me, I thought it was a great introduction to this character. And yes, eventually he'll become that hero that a lot of other Superman, uh, people who love Superman will, will say, okay, it took a little while to get to him and he wouldn't have never, he would have never snapped a neck and he would have protected all those people from Metropolis. And I always look at it like when I saw the film, I never had a problem with any of that because to me, this interpretation of Superman, he was Superman for a day. Like literally he just like got the outfit and is like doing the greatest American hero, like yes. kind of like I'm trying to learn how to fly. And then like, um, by the way, these Kryptonians are here to take you. Uh, they're, they're, they've got everybody. And unless you surrender yourself, like after just one day, they didn't show him like rescuing cats or anything. He's just flying around. Right. Then he's got to hand himself in. <laughs> And then he's got to fight a bunch of other dudes who just didn't have enough time on Earth yet to get used to their powers. And that's why I'm like, look, he knows how to fight. He might not be able to fight like Zod, but Zod doesn't have all the you know laser vision stuff down yet and all this other stuff. So I thought the fight scenes were fantastic. It was the oh, first time that you actually saw Superman versus like Zod or any of these Kryptonians, like these blowout insane fights. Were there too many product placements? Perhaps. But... I was okay with that. I actually, the one scene that a lot of people call out that was like, uh, you know, if I could change that, I would, or I wish that Snyder would, is the Pa Kent doing that thing. Yeah. Hang on a sec. The dog escaped. Right. So I always say he was actually saying, can you come get me now? And Clark just didn't understand. <laughs> he was like, you can pick me up now, dude. And he gets taken with away. With my limited Kryptonian brain, I can't That's understand. Right. So, you know, there's, you know, look, could that be a misstep perhaps? I don't think the Kents were evil, and I don't think they were misguided. I thought the way that they played Pa Kent and saying, should you have saved them? Maybe, maybe not. He's trying to tell Clark, you're going to have to make your own decisions. You're different. You're not human. Right. You've got to hide these powers or figure out what you're going to do with it. But if the minute you reveal that you are not human, everything's going to change. So he cared. He was showing that he loved his son. I, that's my interpretation of it. So there's a lot of different ways to interpret Man of Steel. Mm -hmm. I think myself personally, I would have cut out that when he goes to the other side of the planet and fights that squid thing because it became too much about special effects mm -hmm. and I lost the story. Mm -hmm. Superman's fighting a weird squid thing, went on for like 20 minutes, I got bored, and then he fights Zod. I was like, oh God, can you? couldn't you have just gotten to the Zod scene and cut out that? I right. think if they did that, they would have saved 20 minutes, they probably would have saved like $10 million in special effects and they would have saved at least 20% of the critics hating on the film because they would have gotten to that ending and it would have been more impactful. So 
I think I really, I thought Snyder and Goyer and everyone involved in Man of Steel did a great job, number one, of rebooting a character that has proven to be incredibly hard to reboot, to franchise that character, and number two, to actually start the cinematic universe of DC properly. Now, there are a couple of other misfires that we're not talking about, like Green Lantern. There are other films that are just like, don't, like, hey, bye, see it. We're not, that's not going on. That's not moving forward. Snyder was going to do Man of Steel, and he came out recently in an interview saying, and then I just mentioned, what if, you know, the kryptonite was being delivered to Wayne Manor? Because they already dropped the satellite with Wayne technology. In Man of Steel, they were already setting up, like, yes. look, this is the DC universe. Batman exists. That's Bruce Wayne's satellite. Yes. This, we're in this world. So now Snyder was like, are we going to take that next step? Are we going to move forward? So Man of Steel transformed into Batman versus Superman. And now we're just, we're all waiting. We have, we've had to wait quite a long time. Three Many years. years. Was it three? It it's feels like three years. Yeah. 2000, well, 2013, yeah, it comes out 2016. That's four years. Since but Man they started Steel. promoting it in no, 14. No, I know. Yeah. yeah, it's like, it's a lot. I do have to add also that I get, I, I read a recent interview with, with Schneider that made me kind of rethink Looking at that first movie. It's Schneider. I mean, you keep saying Schneider. Schneider. It's Schneider. It's Schneider because he's got his cigarettes rolled up. It's one day at a time. It's Schneider. He's the one making these movies, right? No, but the, um, yeah, I know. I keep, I don't know why I say Schneider. Zack Schneider, um, he had talked about how he wanted to see what the world would really react to like if a superpower be of course people would be terrified yeah i mean if there was really a guy flying around in that costume in our world we'd be scared of him too and we've been reading comics for our entire lives oh my yeah, God, because a being of of that kind of power and that kind of magnitude is terrifying because what if he's crazy what if he's like you guys are ants and i'm going to take right. you out or is it so god i, I so get it would freak people out is this yeah, god and it would make people doubt in god yep. and so i get i get where Zack snyder is coming from you know it's what the i mean messiah the messiah symbolism we're getting in Batman member superman false yeah. god on the, on the statue and all yeah that. right yeah so i mean i get where he's coming from with it it's just not my like my preference so i'm not crapping on the guy as a i mean again i think he's a great filmmaker i just you know a lot of people are like you just hate i don't hate it i just it's not my thing but come on it you beats know? the 2006 version of superman being turned into a beta male watching lewis lane outside oh, her window course. eating chinese food like of the, course uh, it's like you kidding it, me it's a peeping tom yeah yeah yeah, right. I, I get it. You know, I, I do think Cavill is, a, I mean, look at that. Yeah. Looks like he, he really does Physically, look like he's he was, come from the comics. He was brolic like and you know slowly I mean? comes out the water. And I think, and, I, yeah. and also a lot of carryovers from all the years of them working on, like, not only, you know, Superman Returns, but also <clears throat> Superman Lives, J.J. Yeah. Abrams, Superman Flyby. This costume is definitely a reflection of, like, all those years of working on, like, how are we going to make this character work yeah. for now and right. not for, like, back when we were kids watching the Superman Return. So the leotards look terrible Lewis these Lewis. days. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, the last thing I'll say about Superman is like the trailer for Batman v Superman, which we'll get into in a minute, really shows you how they tied it in and made it make sense that when you see Zod blasting and you've seen the comparison frames that somebody took Zod and then used that outside shot and really related it to why so many people are fearful of Superman and why that would be a, a case in point when you all these people complained about the collateral damage of Man of Steel. Like, how come he's not saving people? Well, maybe it's because he's fighting a mad Superman. Superman. He's a, a, a supervillain of equal strength. In, uh, in all honesty, you've read Miracle Man now. That ending was like Miracle Man. It's yeah. like, it's Miracle yeah. Man having to fight Kid Miracle Man, someone who's unstoppable, a force of evil. Basically what Zod was saying is like, you just killed my world, now I'm gonna kill your world. You're gonna right. have to kill me to stop me. He basically said that, and that's why the, the ending ended that way is, I don't think Superman knew what to do. I think it's like the only thing I could do to save that family. There's already thousands of people have died in these buildings. I'm gonna have to do something. Did he regret doing it? I think he did. And then Absolutely. I think that's that's the, what I think Superman or whatever the Batman v Superman movie is going to reflect on is like, you, you killed all these people. Do you think he doesn't feel bad about that? I'm sure that's a heavy weight to hold and that's what Superman's gonna have to hold for the rest of his life. Does that turn him into a more powerful, better person? I think so. Damn it, Schnapp! All right, let's you move on. Make me wanna, <laughs> you always make me rethink this stuff so much that I'm like, now I'm a turncoat against my own <laughs> belief. All right, well, um, All right. Hey, what can I say? Let's move on to a year just last year, 2014. This is the year I wanted to start with, and this is the year that I think really truly started what we're talking about, which is the golden age of superhero films, television shows, movies, the, just the launching pad of like every, every single company saying, Here's our game plan. Check it yep. out. Every everybody's taken down like dates, times, 
years, yes. all the way up in the 20, what are we at, 2025? I mean, how many years are it's we 20, forward? 20 ups in Yeah, right, I mean, yeah. 2020, 2021 right now, we were like, and that was last year when people were like, I think it might have even been 2013, we we're like, no, we got this, we got that. Everybody started talking about, so now we're like, we live in a world where last year we had three big superhero titles all playing at the cinema. I remember just looking and seeing, look, there's Captain America, there's Spider-Man and there's X-Men and there's these posters of comics that I read as a kid and they're giant big budget films that everyone is watching now. I mean, this is a fantastic year yep. for fans like us. Let's talk about, let's just talk about, let's uh, round table talk about, we don't have to talk about them in any specific order, but let's, let's talk about Captain America Winter Soldier first. So Captain America Winter Soldier is obviously the follow-up to the first Avenger, but now Steve Rogers is here in the, in the modern world and dealing with modern issues. What do you think, Vito? I, I really loved Winter Soldier. I think it's my favorite of the Marvel movies so mm -hmm. far, uh, only because it gave us something that we had not seen before, and it showed that Marvel wasn't going to just be about superheroes. It could be about this larger world that they had created. And the fact that you have a hero who's willing to take down the institution that not only found him and revitalized him and, and introduced him to the world, he's willing to take down S.H.I.E.L.D. in this movie. It shows that Captain America is about more than just you know, his own vision. He is really about everyone as a whole and, and doing what's best for us, even if it means destroying the old, the old world. So it, it made a really good parallel between he and the villain who had the same goal, except his were dark, right. you know, but I, I love the fact that it was like a seventies movie that Robert Redford was able to get his name out there to a new generation. So people could see, you know, what he was all about. You yeah. know, maybe some people went out to check his movies out now and stuff. They're like, maybe I will watch Three Days of the Condor. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it had that 70s, like, paranoid thriller vibe, yeah. mm -hmm. which is really, really amazing. I thought it expanded the genre uh, while still, you know, you're, you're sitting there going to a superhero movie and you're like, this is Gene Hackman could have been in this totally. in the 70s. You know what I mean? I don't know. I, I loved it. I think it's the best one um, for complexity of character and just how well written it is and how they reintroduce Bucky. I mean, yes. there was not a false note in that. The, to me, this is the one, the one superhero movie that there are no false notes. Everything in it is so well done that I, I, I got out of there and I was like, there's nothing that I would pick apart in it. How about you? I agree. I agree with Vito. Absolutely. It was almost no perfect. They took the parallax view, three days of the condor, yeah, and made yeah. it modern parallax day. view. Love yeah, that. Film. Yeah. And they, they made us and put a superhero in it and you get to see Steve Rogers conflicted. The, 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 the diary keeps trying to keep up with everything. Totally. The Falcon, yeah. um, Alexander Pierce, of course, is Redford. That's why I always tell readers, Marvel aims high with talent. They're that high. Yes, they and, do. They, and they close, they get him. Uh, of course, the winter soldier, the fighting and the choreography is some of the best you ever seen in, in, in Fantastic. In, absolutely. When especially with Bucky when he goes hand to hand with Steve. Boom, boom. Well, I mean, remember at Comic Con that one shot of of uh, Bucky punching the shield, mm -hmm. and then you actually see it realized on screen. Um, Nick Fury, you know, then then him going underground, the Black Widow team up. It's just it's another one that I when it's on, I keep it on, and it's fast, it moves, uh, and it's also setting up the bigger world of which we're now going to get in oh, yeah. Captain America's Civil War with the teams. Uh, we're going to see more crossbones, more Bucky, and more and more Cap dealing with the complexities of today's modern world. You know? Yeah, I, I agree with you both. I think it's the best standalone Marvel film that oh. they've put out yet, the best, the best directed. I mean, the Russo brothers knocked it out oh, of the absolutely. park. I mean, yeah. And I was one of those people like, really? The guys from Community? <laughs> I'd never say that again. Now I'm like, hey, you get whatever, whoever you think is best, and I'll wait and see if the movie sucks or not. Exactly. And usually, luckily, we've been very lucky that almost all of the Marvel films have been unbelievably fantastic and satisfying on all, on all these different levels. Winter Soldier, incredibly satisfying, not just as like a 70s kind of thriller. Uh, you know, like I love just you know, the introduction of Hail Hydra, just that like, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, I, yeah, genius. I, I mean, him and the Falcon just had such a great chemistry, amazing casting with Anthony Mackie. Just, I mean, note for note, I think that movie is really one of my favorites. And the action scenes, just the Nick Fury car chase scene. Oh, really, so that's good. one of those yeah. cars. I was like, the only film that beat that film for a car chase film that I've ever seen is The Raid 2. That car yeah. chase scene oh, still in The it. Raid 2 is just definitely drop the mic yo it's like wait someone else to be someone has to beat that right so that was baller yeah that's some crazy stuff so captain america winter soldier is like to me it's like my top number one marvel film standalone wow. film okay. yeah. you know yeah. avengers for yep. a group film but winter soldier is number one let's talk about the amazing spider-man 2 
Let's so, not. not. Well, you know, look, I, I got to mention it because out of 2014, that's to me really the only stinker. But, you know, I said yeah. I didn't want to talk about too many stinkers. But let's talk about that for a number of reasons. Number one, that was a reboot. Mm -hmm. So it was like we they had established, you know, Raimi, we're not going to let you do Spider-Man 4. And that was kind of weird because they were already in production on it. They were just like, pull the plug. And they already had this other script being written because they, yeah. you know, the producers were like, we're not 100% sure. But, you know, bam, all of a sudden now we're doing a reboot. We saw the reboot. Mark Webb, I thought, did a good job with The Amazing Spider-Man. I didn't hate it. It took me a long time to see it. I actually saw it after, I saw it weeks after Batman, um, The Dark Knight Rises, because mm -hmm. I was one of those people who didn't like Dark Knight Rises, so I was not on at least my list. It didn't It didn't do finish the trilogy for me, so I was like, fine. If I don't like Dark Knight Rises, I guess I'm going to go see The Amazing Spider-Man, and surprisingly liked it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I thought it was like, hey, it's a... For a reboot of a of a of a franchise that I didn't feel necessarily needed a reboot, mm -hmm. they did a good job, and then they pooped it with the Amazing Spider-Man two by going back to Batman and Robin territory, oh. where literally I think it was a, a series of really horrible events where you had a bunch of clueless producers who don't know anything about comics who basically have their assistants buy me this so I could flip through it and make notes like I right. know what I'm doing. It's very telltale signs of exactly that. It's like you yes. don't, not only did you not read the comic and just kind of look at it like a, an idiot, but you didn't understand who these characters are because the tonality shifts and the changes with every single scene in this movie. The Amazing Spider-Man, I like to use as a reference when somebody says, well, the Gwen Stacy and uh, Peter Parker scenes weren't that bad. I'm like, they're only good because the rest of the movie was so horrible. If you take the rest of the movie away and just watch those scenes, those those scenes alone ring fake and false. I'm just like, it's just two people who are just talking about their relationship every single scene that they're in. It really nothing advances in that movie except can I get out of the theater soon enough? What right. did you think about that film? Uh, I, it's very weird because my buddy Anthony gets really pissed at me when I say this, but I, I say that The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is the greatest... Uh, Joel Schumacher Batman movie never made. The origin, wow. the origin sequence for Electro is straight out of a Joel Schumacher Batman I movie. Agree. I've fallen into this vat of. I mean, it was it was so comical and so over the top. If you watch those scenes, I'm not kidding. Go back and just watch the scenes with Jamie Foxx, and it's like Jamie Foxx was like, "This is a Batman movie, right? This is a Joel Schumacher yes. movie." He was overplaying that, and I think he's a great actor. I mean, anybody who's seen Collateral, sure, or, and it, the guy's a great actor. He just didn't get that character. He you didn't know. get this character um, at all. He and was I didn't the like Riddler the, and Mr. Freeze yeah, combined. And, yeah, and I didn't like the interpretation. I, I I didn't want to see him as the starfish, you know, version of Electro. Mm -hmm. But I, it was weird how much he looked like Doctor Manhattan and how totally. they started turning him into a god. And it, I just felt his motivations. Uh, you know, I'm talking about motivations like I'm an actor, but his motivations for hating Spider Man. He was like, I love Spider Man, and then suddenly Spider Man gets more camera time than he does, and now he hates Spider Man. And I mean, it was this just a oh, I'm sorry, this. you mean motivations? You mean bad script writing right. and horrible decisions? And, and, and again, <laughs> I, it's weird because I, I love 500 Days of Summer. I think Mark Webb is an incredible... He's done some great music videos. I mean, the sure. guy's got talent. And when it comes to actual people talking, I feel he did a really good job with those scenes. But the rest of it, like... <sighs> you know, I mean, that's one of those situations as a director. Like, you sometimes are are not responsible for how an actor is going to portray their character. Right. And I think Jamie Foxx is a big enough actor. He's won Oscars where he's like, this is how I'm playing Electro. You're not going to tell me anything. So yeah, you really left helpless to be like, okay, you're going to ruin my film. So what's the tone of the film now? Then you have other producers telling you other stuff. Get Paul Giamatti in there. Force that rhino. Why is he acting so crazy? Does he know what movie he's in? Right. Why is Paul Giamatti yelling the whole time? Right. Just horrible decisions. You don't know who's in charge. I mean, I'm not going to blame all these actors. It's easy to blame people. I think it's everybody. All the people involved in The Amazing Spider-Man should all be fired. You know what I mean? So unfortunately, like some of them are left straggling and being dragged along into the Marvel deal. But thank God, at least... Half of it is being taken the reins. I don't know what the control issues are, but hopefully Feige's like, why don't you stand over in that corner and watch how it's done? Right. Don't say anything. Right. Because all I have to do is show you this DVD of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Why don't you watch it? Oh, that's right. You made it. You know, it's yeah. like, don't don't bring that with, you it's know. It's the scene in Get Shorty where he's talking to uh, the Bo Catlett character and he goes, now why don't you leave the film business to those of us who know what we're doing? 
I love Ooh, that scene. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because like, and it is weird. So for those of you out there who who we're we're all filmmakers here. You know what I mean? We've we've all made stuff, good or bad. I've made some stinkers myself, but like, it's very difficult to get a movie made. It's so hard to get everybody on board. Yep. So anybody who makes a movie, you want to root for that movie. Where you know what I mean? I think that's something. A lot of times you read talk back on any of our sites, oh, and Christ. the people get so pissed because we're so we're passionate about it, but we know how hard it is to make a movie. It's not easy. So the fact that Amazing Spider-Man 2 got made in the first place is amazing. We mm -hmm. didn't want to hate it, right? No. We didn't want to watch it, love and it not and and you know, but but you're right. I I really don't understand. I've never understood why studios can't just find somebody they trust, step back and let them do it. You look at like Legendary they do that, you know what I mean? They let Del Toro do what he wanted with Pacific Rim, right. love it or hate it. You know, he was able to kind of make the movie he wanted to make. Just let somebody have a vision, rein them in if you need to. But I, I think too much. It's the too many cooks in the kitchen scenario. Yeah. I mean, you know I think I mean? Josh like, Trank just got that happen. Uh, he got his head handed to him by Fox in the same scenario with the Amazing Spider-Man Two, Fantastic Four, stinks of all that. Like people re-manipulating and recutting and reshooting. It's just, it has all of that. It doesn't beat The Amazing Spider-Man as being as crappy, at least in my my personal feeling. What do you think about The Amazing Spider-Man? Ama I don't, because to be brutally honest, I still to this day haven't seen The Amazing Spider-Man or The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I even want to see them at the old medias for free, even. The only thing that I'll remember from this series that I could say is that the movies were so bad that those two movies were responsible for bringing Marvel proper back to the negotiating table with Sony to work out a deal where Marvel could kind of overwatch what they're doing with Spider-Man, which right. now leads us to what we're going to get in Civil War, mm -hmm. which has me very excited, under the proper guidance and care of Marvel proper. Sony's doing the right, right. thing by, and he's going to have, he's going to be more than a cameo, so let's get this out of the way. Spider-Man is right. going to be very involved, and he's on Tony Stark's side. And uh, well, we're talking about that in a minute. Yeah. Let's let's okay. save that so, flavor yeah, but for amazing, a uh, in terms of amazing Spider Man, the reboot and the second one, meh pass. Yeah. Now I do have to ask very quickly, do you think that this Fantastic Four thing is gonna force Fox into finally teaming up with Marvel? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. The blood uh, between those come two on, studios, Fox. those two studios do not like each other, man. I don't so know. But Feige is a master negotiator and he look. Tony Stark almost didn't happen in Civil War. They were going right. to one of them out. Feige stepped in. They went to Soul House. They talked it out, and a deal was ironed. Mm. Anyone could get these people to talk. It'd be him. Now, there's a lot of bad blood between Feige and Fox. I've going heard, back, yeah. going back. So I don't know if he's if he he'll probably rise above it. If there is an opportunity or perhaps a chance for them to discuss them possibly working together. I would hope so. I like that rumor that I just uh, read there where they're like, look, you can have an X-Men TV series, but give us back the Fantastic Four. I know that would be hot. Uh, you know, who knows? Let's move on to another amazing 2014 film, The X-Men, Days of Future, Future Past. Past. Now, this film, based on a comic book series by Chris Claremont and John Byrne from the 80s, this film put the X-Men back as my favorite team core group right there with the Avengers. This film is fantastic. Now, look, we, you know, I complain a lot about Brian Singer as like helping ruin the Superman Returns film because mm -hmm. you know it's his idea to like, hey, let's do this uh, Richard Donner thing, and he's the one who basically came in and stopped McG and doing all the Superman flyby stuff. That just got crushed when he said, let's do this because they were like, well, that's a better idea. So, you know, we all watched it. You know, I'm not you know quiet about how I didn't like the Superman Returns. But Brian Singer is an incredible director. Yes, I'm, I've is. never said anything about his directing skill or his producing skill. He's made amazing films, Usual Suspects and Forward. I mean, and I think when he got the, his hands on X Men, he got his hands on something that he really understood and can transform and took the core essence of what it is to be a mutant and was able to put that on screen. And every time he's come and done a, an episode with these characters, added nuances, added an adult flavor, added all these elements that just puts this these films just so much above some of these other film, other superhero films. It's just all the films always rise above. Days of Future Past is easily one of my favorite superhero films of 2014. Vito, what do you think about it? I thought it was pretty damn amazing. Um, I love the fact that we can finally see Professor X and, and he's not just this goody two shoes that you, you you think he is just as we've seen the younger magneto you really get this complex feel about who these people are why they are who they are when they're adults i thought it was genius uh spoilers for those of you who have not seen the movie i hope you have but uh, i love the fact that they were able to reboot 
some of the things that you didn't like, like sure. X-Men Wolverine Origins and uh, uh, The Last Stand, which we don't want to mention even in passing. But I mean, you know, like it was brilliant how they kind of brought everything together. They made you realize why there were mistakes in all the movies. Right. It was just really brilliant how, how they did it. I think the only thing that they wouldn't be able to explain is how Hugh Jackman gets more ripped through time because like <laughs> he's like super ripped in this movie you watch the first x-men he's really skinny right and you're right. like wow something weird is happening with the time ripple. 200 milligrams a week of testosterone will do right that exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> what do you think of it oh god first so avengers gives us the first ever superhero team of movie x-men days of future past to get to another level where we get a previous generation of x-men with a younger generation of x-men that was super they teamed hot. up with themselves yes, yes they right. teamed up with weird. themselves the younger yeah. and the older version that was hot the sentinels yeah. i think came off cool Fantastic. uh wolverine and like you said he was brolic as hell as, as he gets older he gets more cut um it was it was it, i'm and i've never been one really into the x-men i'm not really into mutants and stuff but it worked. Yeah, it worked, and it worked perfectly, and that's why we're getting now this. You know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm really, and I really like the way they went. First class was uh, '60s, Days of Future Past was '70s, X Men yeah. Apocalypse is going to be '80s. 80s. I think yeah. it's fantastic. It's I love, amazing. I love what they're doing with this revitalized X Men franchise. Great news to hear, like you said, yeah. that you know Fassbender and McAvoy signed on to keep doing these characters because they're just nailing it. They're knocking it out of the park. I. I can't wait to see X Men Apocalypse. I wonder though if, in now that they're going eighties, if uh, Professor X and uh, Magneto are going to be the Tubbs and um, uh, Crockett, uh, like they dress Vice. in Vice. Vice. Yeah, I certainly absolutely. hope Jennifer Lawrence returns. I thought I think Not she's happening. killed it every time as as a Mystique. Yeah, she she said, you know, hey, look, you know, never say never. Now that Fassbender McAvoy jumped on, I bet you, I bet they'll pay. They she's very expensive. Pay. She's they, gonna want what the males are making. Yo, she's worth it. Absolutely. Give her whatever done, she wants I to agree. keep her around. I agree. All right, let's move on to another fantastic 2014 film, a film that came out of left field that no one knew what the hell it was. And then when it dropped, everyone's talking about it's the next Star Wars. It's Guardians of the Galaxy. So this is a a property from Marvel that no one knew anything about. In fact, that's the whole reason I'm even sitting here in this at, at this desk right now because John Campia was like, what the hell is this Guardians of the Galaxy thing? And uh, a friend of mine, Ben, suggested me like, hey, I, I know this guy Schnapp, he's good on camera, he's a super nerd, he knows everything about comics, get him in, on the show. So I came on and guested on the, on, back when it was called For Your Consideration, three years ago, and just talked about Guardians of the Galaxy. And you know, I was like, hey, this is, the, this is what the series is. This is what it transformed into. These are the characters they added. These are the Infinity Stones. And this is like things like Adam Warlock that you're gonna, you're gonna see all this stuff in the next few years. And you know, the movie came out. I became a regular on Movie Talk. A so star is born. Thank you, Guardians, for uh, having, having my ass sit at this chair. So it's, let's talk about that. I'll say for myself, I thought Guardians of the Galaxy is an incredibly fun film. And I'm so happy they got James Gunn to direct it because James Gunn added so much flavor that would have never been there if they got just a studio guy. Or, I right. couldn't even think of like who would replace him because he added such a personal, cool, weirdo stamp to it. Because if you look at all of his other films like Slither, you got Tromeo and Juliet, yeah. that guy's done independent film. That guy's got his own stamp, super all of his films have a fun edge to them. Yeah. And he brought that edge to Guardians of the Galaxy, and Feige let him do it. Feige, they it's, were like, "Bring your flavor. We want you. We want that James Gunn flavor in there." Yes, and that's what I think put it. It made it different. It added like you already have Guardians of the Galaxy is already kind of a weird, a uh, '70s kind of freaky. You know, hey, we're getting cosmic. You know, and then you know they add a lot of like '80s and '90s flavor when they added Rocket Raccoon. So, let, Vito, talk about Guardians. Well, I I'm a big fan of James Gunn. I love the fact that he brought a punk rock punk rock vibe to this this totally. movie. Um, it, it, I loved Rocket Raccoon as a kid. I never thought I would get to see it in a, the character in a movie. Never. I mean, it, it blows my mind. Uh, I'm one of the people who thought if Marvel's going to tank a movie, it's going to be this movie though, because there were so many factors that you had to weigh in. Nobody knew who these characters were. I mean, you're starting with Iron Man, which nobody knew. I mean, right. no one had heard of this. Uh, I went to the movie with a lot of trepidation, and when it was over, I was smiling. And I remember I turned to my buddy and I was like, "I'm gonna go see this again, like tonight." Mm -hmm. um, it, it is you. You you pointed out it's the Star Wars of our gener or of this generation. I honestly believe that every kid who saw this movie went, "I'm gonna go out and become a filmmaker." I think this is the movie that was like Star Wars was mm -hmm. for us. 
You know what I mean? Everybody who saw this said, wow, it blew my mind. I'm going to go out and I want to create these things too. And I mean, come on, look at this cast. I mean, every single person in this movie, a lot of people don't know Jason Momoa was cast as as Drax the Destroyer, and he turned it down in order to do uh, Aquaman, I yep. believe, right? Which I think was a really big mistake on his part because... I would have wanted him to see him in this movie, but at the same time, you get to see Bautista just like knock it out of the park. And actually, I don't know, now that I think about it, I've just changed my mind because Momoa, I think, would have been too serious for the character. Bautista didn't take it seriously, and that's why he was such a great character. It lended, you know, to that fun feel. I don't know, I love the movie. I thought it was, it's probably my second favorite of the Marvel movies yeah, after definitely. Captain America, the Winter Soldier. So. Oh, I love the movie, but it also brings back memories of me breaking Rocket Raccoon, and this is the movie Marvel got legal on us because we were scooping mm. the hell out of it. But All right. I remember, uh, I, Feige's always been a huge Star Wars nerd as a kid from the 80s. Um, and he wanted, when Lucasfilm came aboard Disney, he wanted to like have a say in it. They didn't let him have it. So you know what? We're going to make our own Star Wars movie. And exactly that's what they did. They conquered Earth. Now they're going to conquer the galaxy. So we have these four characters that no one's practically ever heard of. They, are, they all work together as a team. And s- multiple stars are born. Batista now, Inspector. Chris Pratt, megastar in the sure. third biggest box office uh, domestic. Maybe, maybe he's going to be Indiana Jones. Who maybe knows? he probably will be Indiana Jones. I'm sure Bradley, he is. Bradley. Everybody, got, everybody jumped off this movie. And it's so entertaining. It's so much fun. That soundtrack... The '80s mix oh, come amazing. out. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it was it was just perfect. It was perfect. It's a it's it's a space opera in the Marvel sense, and I can't wait till they see what they do with the sequel. But it's yeah. it's it's a fun movie, man, and I, I had a great time watching it and stuff. I did too. I, re- I was really happy that they were able to take a lot of the '70s elements and marry them with the newer version of the Guardians of the Galaxy with Rocket Raccoon mm-hmm. and Groot. But it was such a, a fun and different take. Mm-hmm. On space fair in general, yes, I you know the way they introduce the Nova Corps, the way they introduce yeah. all these different, where you're like, how are they ever going to introduce the Celestials? Bam, you see the Nova Corps showing a scene of the Celestial. My mind was blown how <laughs> smart yes. and awesome they were. Like, there's Thanos. That's how he fits into this world. Yeah. They wove the Marvel cosmic web, the universe, the galaxy, perfectly in this yep. film by introducing it with like throwaways yeah that's the way you introduce don't i don't need like some scrolling explanation the explanation just you know mention it that's uh, over oh they're over there they're in this part of the world oh these guys show them on a video clip that's smart yep. that's just well smart. that was the argument when when in fantastic four uh, the rise of the silver surfer they said we can't show this big you know purple guy with an antenna on his head nobody wants to see that it's so stupid and absurd and yeah which moron said shot, that yeah you get the Celestials, which is basically what what Galactus would have looked like in the Fantastic Four movie. Totally. And you're like, people just buy it because they buy it. And then you're like, oh, that's a head of a Celestial. And they, they have a huge mall in there. I mean, like, you just buy it because you make they, it they cool. world build. Yeah. And they show you, you know, they do it right. Don't have and a big, so. dumb purple cloud, you morons. Oh. You know, the same thing with Green Lantern, a giant poo cloud, you idiots. You know, it's like <laughs> the next guy loud. who brings a cloud, you're going to have to talk to me. I'm just sick of these, like, right. idiot producers are like, well, I don't think anyone's going to buy this. Like, you know, oh, I'm sorry. What kind of fucking moron are you? Right. I'm just sorry. So I'm trying not <laughs> to swear on this. So, don't be sorry. All right. Let's move on and talk about a movie that actually won an Oscar. It's called Birdman. Now, I'm bringing up Birdman. It's not a superhero film in the any stretch of the imagination. But why I'm bringing it up is because we've gotten to the point now that we are getting meta with the idea of not only what Birdman which is about, which is acting and decisions and what's better theater or to just sell out when you acted as Birdman or Batman or however, they're dealing with superhero films as a statement on society. Is it mm-hmm. is it like, are these just big, empty, vacant, explosion, popcorn, check your mind at the door type things? Is there something important about superhero films? What really is important when you're an actor? Are these plays that this guy's trying, that he's doing on stage, he's just really working through issues that he's dealing with in his own life, has nothing to do with Raymond Carver or any of his books. I love Raymond Carver. I've read all of Raymond Carver's books. So this is really, you don't even have to have read any Raymond Carver books to appreciate Birdman because it's all, it activates on so many different levels. That's why I won that Oscar. What are your guys' thoughts about Birdman? Um, a little conflicted 
basically, it's a good film. It's good full of good performances. I tell my actor friends, you got to watch it for the performance. But the thing is that it will always stick out to me. It was a big, it's a movie that spawned the current batch of anti-superhero movie articles that's out there, the superhero fatigue movement. Even at the Academy Awards, they were disrespecting superhero mm -hmm. movies because of this. So this movie brought on a lot of hate in the real world that I'm not too fond of because I get all of it. I always right. see what, the, you know, the, and it was a commentary on actors and superhero films in general. It was a, just a negative one. And it, st it stood for everything that I'm against. You know, superhero films are not the enemy. They're, they're, they didn't kill independent film. They're not the only things that work in movie theaters. Come on, man. It's like superhero movies are now getting stigmatized. And part of the reason I blame is this movie. That's just my two cents. How about oh. you, Vito? Uh, I love the movie. Um, however, I, I I hadn't realized, you know, that it had caused... I, I, I've noticed that there's been a big backlash now with superhero oh, films. Jesus but that's going to come. I mean, it's going to happen. Um, but I, I think it was a really amazing look at what... Yeah, you know what it means to be an actor having to earn a living versus making art. You know what I mean? Uh, you're an actor, John, right? Mm -hmm. Are you? Have you acted? Ooh, like twenty years it's, ago. It's <laughs> yeah, but we, we, you know, acting. I, I mean, I thought it was really amazing. You look at Michael Keaton, prime example, blows up with with these Batman movies, and after that, he has a really hard time, you know, getting stuff made. He's he becomes a bit actor again, you know, and then he does a movie that's a meta commentary on his own on his own career right. and it blows him up again. And, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm conflicted because I love the movie, but I, I don't know. I didn't see it as an anti superhero film. Mm -hmm. uh, I just saw it as it, it's more, I think they use that as just the jumping point to ask, you know, what is it? I don't even know what I'm saying right now. Well, look, it's, I'll, it's, I'll, I'll I, it I like the movie. I don't think it's an anti superhero film in the least bit. Like I'll look, I'll go back to like 2003 when our own people in our own industry, as I'll say, oh our God. comic book industry, were predicting the death, the death knell of the superhero film. We've had these kind of people around at forever, but it became a movement in 2003, 2004, like all these superhero films that are coming out. It's, a, it's the end of the superhero film. We're going to feel that glut in 2007. I kept reading articles in 2008. Oh, when these films come out. Oh, when the wow. Avengers come out. Uh, so people are going to be sick and tired of these. Oh, now they've announced this entire slate. I've been hearing this every year I hear somebody. Yeah. So to me, I'm saying bring it on, man. I don't mind anybody bashing superhero films because guess what? There's going to be haters. There's been haters. There's always going to be haters. And in the future, you're going to have more haters. There's people advance hating on Fantastic Four before they even saw it. Yeah, There's man. people hating on it right now without having seen it. I knew it was going to suck. Guess what? You didn't see it. You don't even have an opinion. Thank you. Your opinion doesn't count at all if you haven't seen the movie. <laughs> if you saw the movie, then let's talk. If you haven't seen the movie, get lost. That's how I feel about it. Excellent. You're invalidated. By just jumping on a bandwagon of whatever bandwagon you want to rock on, you're going off a cliff. Just like in Halo, son, I'm driving you off a cliff. Get on my Jeep, you'll see what happens. Betrayal, suicide. That's what's good. That's what's happening, man. I think in the in the world that we live in, everyone's got comments, everyone's got opinions. Your opinion's valid as long as you validate it. As if you've seen the film, then I'll listen to what you have to say. A lot of people are like, it's a good thing I don't have to see it. I knew it was going to suck. Really? Has Look, it been my experience? So far, the readers that follow me on Twitter that have seen the movie have agreed with me. Yeah, it's not that bad. It's actually good the first two parts. It kind of falls upon the third act. So it's like you said. Sure. See the movie, make your opinion, and validate it before, you know, attacking it. You know, I mean, I, this movie had an agenda against it since before they even saw the first frame of the film. Well, I don't, he, I disagree with you. I don't think Birdman had an agenda. No, against, I'm talking about Fantastic Four. Oh, I see. Yeah. I'm sorry. But yeah, well, well, going on about like, you know, like I have strong opinions on super, on superhero films and a lot of people of are like, oh, I hate that you keep bashing on Amazing Spider-Man. That's just my opinion <laughs> right. on the Amazing Spider-Man too. I'm not saying that you're wrong if you enjoyed it or if you, or if you enjoyed Batman and Robin. Like, I'm older, so a lot of kids grew up who are now like 22, 23. They saw Batman and Robin when they were eight, which yeah. is actually what it was made for. It was made for little kids who were going to buy those action figures. I'm Poison Ivy. Look, I'm Mr. Freeze. Chill out. It makes sense if you're eight. Right. You're going to love that film. Guess what? It was on repeat on cable when you were eight. I understand why you like that. I also understand why you like Phantom Menace. That doesn't mean it's a good film. That just means <laughs> that you happen to be young enough yep. that it worked 
And now you're old enough that that film rocks your nostalgia. You know, it's hitting you in a different zone than it hit us because we saw Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, then nothing. Then we saw a giant piece of shit called The Phantom Menace, <laughs> which basically everyone's like, you really ruined my childhood. It didn't ruin my childhood. I just couldn't wait to get out of the theater. Right. I was bored out of my skull. I'm one of those people who didn't drink the Kool-Aid. I saw the movie and I was like, I hated this film while I was watching it. Yeah. All these other people are like, dude, what's up, man? It was amazing. A couple of years later, you're right, it sucked. It's yeah. like, I get it though, because you were so excited to love this movie, you didn't want to see the faults. You didn't want to see Jar Jar. You didn't want to see the horrible wooden acting. You, it's It makes sense. So that's right. what the society we live in, especially the nerd culture, you don't want films to suck. You want them to be amazing. Absolutely. You want The Dark Knight Rises to be the trilogy ending fantastic film that you want it to be. Whether or not you accept it or whether or not you want to argue with me about it, that's a totally different category than what is reality. Right. So for myself, like with Birdman, I thought it was an incredible film, fantastically directed, amazingly written, and it, and it hit me on a lot of different chords. I never felt it was an anti-superhero film. The anti-superhero people took their agenda and attached it to this film. Okay, That's yeah. how I feel about it. It's You can always ride on coattails. That's all I'll say about that. Interesting, mm. yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles also dropped in 2014. Now this is a film that I can honestly say I missed the boat. I was too old when this came out. I was reading the comic books. Maybe, I read the comics. For you. And uh, they were already, when, they, when the comics came out, they were too expensive. I was like, oh, I missed the boat on that. I bought Atomic Teenage uh, Adolescent Hamsters or whatever. And I was like, is yes. this what's supposed to be <laughs> they, good? They tried to revive them, by the way, at uh, Dynamite last year. Really? Yeah. Boo. Comic, whatever. Was, they had a was adolescent one. preteen. No, it was, uh, it was adolescent radioactive uh, teenage hamsters, hamsters or something, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. I bought wow. that one. I was like, I yeah. guess this one, is, this is what it's supposed to be. I didn't right. get it. So I never got into any of the Teenage Mutant Ninja movies. I remember seeing the first one and I didn't hate it. It just, it didn't, it never connected yeah. with me. Oh, it's these mutant turtles that eat pizza or whatever. That's, that's cool. Like never watched the cartoon. So myself, when this movie came out and I remember people just going nuts when Michael Bay was like, it's going to be there from outer space. People just oh freaked my God, out. They lost their minds, but yeah. I didn't I didn't understand the anger about it. I was like, "Well, so what if they're 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 humanoid turtles with ninja powers? Why not have them from outer space? That makes more sense to me. Blasphemy." So I didn't really get it. And you know, I know Kevin Eastman, he's a super talented dude, ran heavy metal for many years, incredible artist. So, I mean, look, I saw Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with zero history and zero like baggage, and I didn't hate the film. I enjoyed it. I thought this this newer version, of course, they're not from outer space. They're all have. I thought it was fun. So I mean, that's my opinion. What did you guys think about? It? I I actually have not seen that version yet. I've seen all of the old movies and I, I read the comics and right. stuff. Uh, I'm not sure why I haven't seen it yet. It just hasn't been high on my on my to do list. Right. But uh, I haven't heard bad things about it. To be honest with you, I mean, I I I was one of the people who was like, why would you want to make them aliens when that's not fun? That's like saying Superman's from Earth and he gets. I, you know, as as the reverse thing, if Man of Steel would have been, he was a human who got doused in some kind of He lust. drank kryptonite you know to I get mean? his and powers. He's like, like, that's and he's like, insane. My powers. You know, you would have been like, what the fuck is this? Right. You know, like, so I get the anger that they were going to be extraterrestrials and stuff right. like that. Um, but I have not seen the movie. I, I personally, it doesn't look that bad to me. I think their noses are kind of weird looking. You know, I, they don't look... The, the faces aren't appealing to me. You know, they're they're a little more scary than what I think most kids would be into. But I, I have nothing against it. I don't know. I'll watch it. I just haven't seen it. I liked it. I saw it in an old media screening. I thought it was fun. I, I, uh, I got on the... I was lucky enough to get on the bandwagon in the early 80s. I still have the second black and white Eastman and Laird Ninja Turtle comic. I, gotta go, I have to send it to the CGC. I had fun with it. And then, you know, we had that movie in the 1990s, the first Teenage Mutant sure. Ninja Turtles movie. So that was for my generation, the turtle movie. So seeing what the next generation had. And so this is before the commercialization of the turtles, when they went thermonuclear with that cartoon, the movie. Sure. So I'm looking at the movies like, okay, I think it's something cool for a new generation. I had fun with it. I thought the CG was good. The action was okay. It is what it is, you know, and then we're getting a sequel now in yeah. two years. All right, so then that brings us to 2015, and that brings us to the end of part one of our very special heroes, special after school, special edition, where we're talking about the golden age of heroes. I'm here with Umberto and Vito, and we're gonna rock the second part coming up. Check it out. It should be clicking right around in the same area wherever you'd have to click to watch this. There'll be part two, so check that out coming at you. 
heroes.